right, uh, welcome to Dice Junkies. Uh, today we have a very special guest with us, uh, Mr. Trevor Duvall. Uh, Mr. Duvall's uh, resume uh, includes on the higher level that I'm aware of as far as Rocket the Raccoon on Guardians of the Galaxy, the TV series, as well as uh, Sheev Palpatine in Lego Star Wars. Uh, reached out to him because of his role as Mac in Gears of War, which is uh, by far our favorite uh, member of Scorpio Squad. Uh, but uh, I'm sure Q's going to drag in uh, some of his other content. But Mr. Duvall, Duvall, thank you very much for joining us today. We appreciate your time. My pleasure. Good to see you all. Good to be here virtually. Good to be among you. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome aboard. You're all, you're up for a ride. Okay. Well, let's get this party started. Well, I'm going to let Blood X go because he's the boring one, and then I'll come in with the interesting stuff. So go ahead, Blood X. <laughs> Well, we could just throw my questions out the window if you want to start off, Q, because yeah. um, mine just the regular boring shit of how to get started in the voice acting, what's your biggest break in the business. But if you want to jump in animate, go right ahead. <laughs> no, 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 no. Let's start with the business first, man. Desserts for later. Okay. All right. We'll, we'll, we'll skip down to number three, and then uh, that way we'll have more time for you to ask your other questions. How about that? Um, so actually, yeah, it's, uh, uh, one of the roles that you're most known for, as I said earlier, is, um, your role of Rocket the Raccoon in Guardians of the Galaxy, uh, which in all honesty is probably one of my personal favorite members of, of Guardians. Um, what can you tell us about your role, uh, as Rocket the Raccoon? Uh, well, it was, um, it was, it was a very nice day when I booked that job, I'm not gonna lie, a very good day. Uh, I knew nothing at all about Guardians of the Galaxy when I auditioned for that job. Nothing at all. I hadn't the the movie hadn't come out yet. The trailers had just started to come out, but I hadn't seen them. All I knew is that they brought me to the studio and they said, "Okay, uh, here's your NDA. You have to sign uh, the character you're reading for." I actually read for a lot of people. I read for all the characters, but uh, when I saw Rocket, it was the description was, "Well, he's a he's an armed raccoon and he's angry," and I'm like. That's, okay, yeah. uh, that's that's fine. That's, that's about something it, to go really. on. That is about it. From a guy who knows a comic, that that's about it. Yeah, <laughs> that was about it. So I was like, okay. So like everything, I just went my with my first instinct, which was sort of a you know not really a New York thing, but kind of a just sort of a George Costanza kind of thing going on. And uh, yeah, that was that. And I booked it, and and it was great. And we did four seasons, three seasons. Three. I don't know a lot. Yeah, I saw that it was three seasons. It ended in 2019. Um, yeah. You know, we were watching it uh, on, on Disney a lot. And, uh, yeah, my kids love it because the movie came out, and it was a, such a success that was beyond ex expectation that I'm I'm actually impressed that they had the forethought to go ahead and get the uh, uh, the anime series off the ground before the films. So I guess they were expecting it to be more of a success than the general audience did. Well, you know, all these big companies, they they assume uh, they, they cast a wide net. Right. So when they they release a movie, they're thinking, OK, well, what about the animated series? What about the merchandising? What about this? What about that? What about that? So luckily, the movie did, as you say, much, uh, uh, much better than I think any of us <laughs> expected, which is great. I love the movie. Um, but what was funny was when I booked the job as Rock again, I didn't really know anything about it and then i saw the trailer and i went oh oh this is this is kind of a big deal and bradley cooper's playing rocket in the movie oh no i'm gonna be compared to him all the time but as it turned out it wasn't uh it wasn't really the case he he was doing his own thing and that was uh that was fine yeah no we we it was, it was just a great great the, the years i played rocket i still kind of play him every now and then some special will come up or something but uh, I got a lot of mileage out of him. I, I played him in uh, series and specials and video games and promotional stuff. So I, it was cool. It was very cool. It was, he was one of my favorite characters for sure. Yeah, it almost sounds like um, – uh, actually, I didn't, I didn't let Q respond before I add my, my comments in. So I'm going to let Q go ahead and do his thing real quick. I don't know. I mean, uh, like you said, um, Right, I I would love the idea that I looked at it and saw that you had played them on multiple occasions, even in games. So you covered it. I was because you were saying you did some side stuff like you played them in the games too when he popped up. And uh, I like what y'all did with them because honestly, to me, Rocket Raccoon was just a raccoon with a gun. So a lot of it, a lot of the filling in had to be done by the people playing the character because 
that's really about his story. I mean, there's somebody out there cursing my name because I don't know all the meta lore, but that's because they weren't really that popular before the movie. So yeah, and and I remember when I did the the audition, what it said was this character has been played before by you know tiny little actors like Seth Green and uh, Billy West, and I was like, oh guys, my man. god, I have to follow this. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> but the it was interesting when I did the audition. The, the the one thing they specifically said was we do not want a, a New York accent, and I think Seth, I think Seth Green had played him with a real, real kind of sort of New York thing when he was doing. I, I think he showed up in Avengers Assemble at one point, and Seth had played him, uh, and, and I think he played him with that sort of New York accent. And they said no, no, we want to get away from that. And I I honestly think the reason why they they did that, I could be wrong about this, but I think the reason why they did that is because. When we do the animated series, they want to have a sense like they they want the audience to, you know, feel like it's reminiscent of the movies, but they don't want a clone of the movies. They want, you know, so so because Bradley Cooper was really sort of leaning into that sort of New York thing a lot of the time, you know, uh, so I, they kind of wanted to dial back. An excellent example of this actually is uh, uh, Mick Wingert, who plays uh, Iron Man in the the last few seasons of Avengers. He does the best Robert Downey Jr. ever, ever. When he did it for me the first time, I was like, oh my God, that's perfect. <laughs> like, it was perfect. But when we, were, when we would record, the directors would always kind of just pull him back a little bit because he was too good. He sounded too much like him. And, they, and I think that they didn't want people to be um, d- comparing this to the movies. They wanted a sense of it, but they didn't want to be... T- so, you know, it, it, it makes sense, but... But oh man, Mix Mix Downey Jr. is just flawless. <laughs> I like imagination. I would have preferred that y'all did it like a perfect rap. <laughs> I'm that person <laughs> that's like, no, I've got the I've got the Iron Man I like. I don't want any other Iron Man. <laughs> like, you know, like like he managed to nail it. You know, old RBJ. Like it broke my heart when I saw him with his up to his elbow in a dragon sphincter and Doctor Doolittle. And I just said, I don't see you <laughs> as Iron Man anymore. Well, oh, you haven't seen that movie? Oh, go watch it, and you won't see Iron Man again next time you see Robert Downey Jr. You're just gonna you're just gonna keep seeing that. Uh, let me get that out yeah. for you, and I'm just like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Don't think that's yeah. a that's a different kind of fist of power. That's a different Infinity Stone gauntlet true. in there. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> yeah, I've never seen it, and not really interested. I liked actually the one with um, Eddie Murphy. I thought that one was actually mm-hmm. entertaining. Um, because it was Eddie Murphy. I think Eddie yeah, Murphy. Because it was a uh, comedy. Yeah, it, it was. It was funny. <laughs> like, no, no, I'm saying like that's. I think that's the best way to go. You shouldn't yeah. try to make a serious Doctor Doolittle. It's. It was a kids' book and a questionable one at some points. So few people know really the material that stuff is based on. I told you I'm a nerd. Like I, I'm going like, yeah, read the book. There's some. <laughs> it'd be canceled today if you really looked at it. But um, uh, but no, like it was a kids' book. So I mean, it's just like when they did the live action Doctor Seuss stuff. They didn't try to be realistic with it because it's like you can't. It's got to be a comedy. Trying yeah. to kind of do a drama, I felt was where it uh probably jumped the shark, and the shark could mm-hmm. talk, and the shark had a Brooklyn accent. I'm making that <laughs> up, but I'm not making up the fact that too many of the animals had modern. Day- I'm sorry, what are we talking about? You got me going down a rabbit hole here. Like, let's talk about for- well years. Well, you, you you were talking about the character that, that keeps on giving, so I will. Uh, jump over to um, uh, one of your other uh, characters when you played Chief Palpatine in Lego Star Wars, because they even brought you back for the holiday special. So you've done several episodes with the Freemakers and uh, yeah. and the holiday special. So uh, uh, well, what can you tell us about playing uh, as, as the Dark Emperor? One of my favorite roles of all time. Uh, we did. We started with the Yoda Chronicles. That was when I was back in Vancouver. And Michael Price was the writer of the show. He's a Simpsons writer. He's also the uh, the primary producer behind F is for Family, which I was on on Netflix. I've seen that too. And uh, when we started doing the Lego Star Wars, they sent out the auditions, and I, obviously I knew who these characters were. Right? They all had code names naturally, but you know, I you know who this is. So right. originally they wanted voice matches. And I thought, okay, well, that's no problem. So, you know, I I think I read for Han Solo and uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi and the Emperor. And they wanted voice matches. So we, okay, I booked the job. That's great. So we move in. We, or we go into the studio, rather. And, uh, you know, we start playing it. And I'm trying to be as 
you know, Lord Zeta, trying to be very, very, you know, as emperor like as possible. But then I realized as we're going through, oh, this is this is a comedy. And it, and it quickly became, oh, wait a minute. We have a lot of latitude here. So my version of the emperor, <laughs> there was one fan who put it perfectly. He said, Trevor De- <laughs> Trevor DeVell's Emperor Palpatine is like a is like the love child between Mark Hamill's The Joker and Stewie Griffin. And I thought, oh, that's exactly right. <laughs> that's exactly right. <laughs> Two huge influences. Because, you know, he, became, he went from being this Lord Vader to being sort of like this guy. <laughs> yeah, Zephyr, Zephyr, yeah, he was the dark side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, yeah, okay, that's good. Lightning hands. So, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, so <laughs> he's he's... What what's hilarious about him is that yeah we did the Yoda Chronicles, and then we did the Freemaker Adventures, and we did all these specials and all these movies, and they still keep bringing me back. <laughs> Every time we do a new special, there's a there's a couple one new ones coming out. I can't tell you anything about them obviously, but there's a couple new ones coming out. And every time I do, I'm like, really? How many times does this guy have to die? Like, <laughs> as, many bring, hey. <laughs> as many times they'll write you a check. As many times they'll write you a check. Take hey, yeah, it, man. Take I love it. it. I love it. And <laughs> and and you know the the Lego guys are great to work with. Uh, they're they're always telling me. Dude, we're trying so hard to get you your own series. I'm like, oh, bring it on. <laughs> Just a Palpatine <laughs> you <know>? series. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, he is he is obviously one of my favorite characters to play. Uh, they really let me they really let me riff with him like they'll basically say yeah you know there's the script but just you know you do you you just do that palpatine magic <laughs> okay so i i do <laughs> somewhere yeah. there's a writer going like oh we got trevor duvall okay good i ain't gotta worry about that <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah <laughs> so what's luke gonna say when whatever palpatine says is crazy like <laughs> they did that the problem is then they gotta react though they're like uh what is he gonna say to that <laughs> yeah <laughs> yes fun. So it's it's really it's interesting that they, they gave you a lot of um, ad lib ability when um, certain franchises are extraordinarily rigid with uh, not having anything other than what's on the script, or you have to plead your case. Hey, I've been you know diving into this character. I think they should say this. Oh no no no, that you're going to say this whether you want to or not. Um, but it's really good because as an actor, you can not only you know invest yourself and in, but you can take on their persona and then really just get creative with it. Um, yeah. Which uh, I think one of the better known references from the Star Wars franchise is when um, uh, Harrison Ford in the in the infamous uh, Empire Strikes Back episode when Leia says, I love you, and he goes, I know. And it was written as, I love you too. Yeah. And George Lucas hated it. No, <laughs> we're not doing it. And they... <laughs> did a test viewing and everybody loved the line. So they, so having that flexibility ahead of time is is phenomenal. So, yeah, it's, I mean, whenever we record the stuff, I, I try to give them at least one pass as written, uh, because you know, I'm a writer too. So I want to make sure that I'm honoring the writers because I know how hard they agonize over every little piece of punctuation. Like I get it. So I always try and give them one as written, but, there's an expectation with these guys that, well, Trav's just going to riff. So <laughs> let him go. And I do. And sometimes I use it. Sometimes I don't. But it's just it's a real it's a real pleasure and an honor to just know that they're um, willing to entertain my bizarre versions of things sometimes, you know. Uh, I'm going to translate that into I tried once as written, then I fix it and I make it good. <laughs> but I can't say that because I'm going to be humble right now, but I fix it. They know where uh, their bread's sometime. buttered. Sometime. Look, look, they know where their bread's buttered. They know who the Palpatine daddy is. <laughs> <laughs> At least that's what I hear, but then I've been told I'm a jerk by everyone. You I've seem all right to me at the moment. No. Oh. You're a terrible yeah. judge of character. <laughs> yeah. I think we've all been called very colorful names as well. Um, Mostly me or you. Colorful. I call everyone else names, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well... <laughs> Speaking of colorful, I'm actually going to jump into uh, a third character, and then we'll probably let just turn wind up Q and let him go. But um, I did want to get into the character of your uh, uh, Gears uh, Scorpio Squad character, Leslie Mac McAllister, uh, which is the most colorful member of Scorpio Squad. Um, just a little side tangent is I think that in our humble gamer opinion, 
uh, the High Buster DLC really kind of saved Gears 5. Oh, wow. I hated it. I hated it. Tell them, man. I hated Gears 5. Story. Oh, really? Story. He, he, Story. He wouldn't finish the campaign. Uh, we went through, it. I think, the first two acts they together. Killed and he was done. <laughs> and I said, let's play oh, High Busters. He goes, I don't want to. I said, let's play High Busters. I've done it twice. You'll like it. And he jumped in, and it was like Gears 1 all over again. We were a squad. We were bantering back and forth. And so... I was imitating you. I was doing a, I was in character for Mac. Uh, that was a funny part. He's got to listen to me doing a Mac impression the whole time <laughs> because I'm loving all his dialogue. And I played through the campaign as Mac all the way through. And I was just like, I'm sorry, blood. So I had to throw that in because I remember that you had to sit through that. And your wife was just like, is that Quinn? Because like, he's just hearing his Irish accent through the headphones because I'm adding dialogue. Scottish. Scottish. Scottish, excuse me. Scottish <laughs> accent. Scottish delivery, man. Don't yeah, worry, because... I'm allowed to be wrong. I can't defend anyone. I'm black. <laughs> but it's funny, he had mentioned out. even on our, our weekly show how much this felt like Gears compared to the main campaign in mm -hmm. Gears 5. So I've got to hear your stories about your character as Mac in Gears 5. Sure. Well, I... Um... I didn't have a lot of knowledge about the Gears franchise at all. I knew it existed, but I knew nothing about it at all. Um, the little bits that I had seen, it sort of, I was like, oh, well, this is kind of like Warhammer 40K-ish. There's elements of that there. There's elements of Space Marine stuff going on, but I knew nothing about it. So when I was brought on for this one, uh, it, it wasn't for Gears 5. It was for the extra, you know, thing, the, the DLCs. And they had this big idea about this new squad. This new squad that went in and they were like, well, they were the hive busters. They they go in and they get themselves intentionally captured and then they fight their way out to destroy the thing from the inside. And I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. So uh, the the audition that they sent me, it just said, I don't even know if it's specifically, excuse me, I don't even know specifically if it said that Mac was Scottish, but I was looking at the description of the character and the, the, the concept art they had for him at the time and it with a name like Mac, I mean, of course he's a Scot. Of course he's a Scot. And just the way, the, it was basically two monologues that they had. Some of the material made it into the final game, but it was mostly just, you know, they, they, put this, they put these sides out just to get a sense of what the character might sound like. And there was a lot of stuff in there about his past, you know, his past as a delivery driver and stuff. A and, great uh, delivery driver. Right. <laughs> So it was just quite natural to me to see this, right? And I was like, well, I, I can do that because this was the very first accent I ever learned, actually, as a wee lad. So it was very natural to me. And I thought, oh, well, he seems like a bit of a, a wee bit of a trickster. <laughs> well, I can give him a wee bit of, you know, I can give him a wee bit of uh, a sense of humor, but also make him a fucking badass too if I have to, right? So, the, yeah, they said, okay, you're the guy. And what was interesting was that the, the head of development at the time he said to me when we were recording the first session, he said, when I heard, <laughs> when I heard your audition, he said, it reminded me of when I was in school. Cause he, he, I think he went to, to Scotland for university or something, but he said he, it reminded me so much of some of the guys that he had known back in the old days. And I was like, Oh, that's a huge compliment actually to, you know, to, to know that it reminded him of the, of the legitimate article. So that was really cool. And then, yeah, we just started doing it. And video games are weird because you don't, you don't really know what the context of anything is because they, they tell you very little, uh, mostly because they don't exactly know what the final is going to be at that point. Like we recorded that game over the course of about three years uh, because things change so much, right? And so you'll go in, and I think the first thing I did was was a bunch of effort sounds, right? Like the, the classic, oh, ah, fire, grenade, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then it was the character stuff. And then at one point later, we went in to do the performance capture work where we did these scenes and we were actually in the suits with the, the balls everywhere. And, you know, uh, it was really cool. It was really cool. But I will tell you that that gang that I worked with uh, on Gears, they were the best. They were just they were just awesome to work with. They were they were so much fun. Um, they were willing to to again let me play right like they would let me play with the character and they would let me sort of like infuse the character with my own knowledge of like scottish syllogisms and things like this so 
it was great. It was, it was a tremendously great experience. Uh, I just, I just loved it. Oh uh, yeah. I, I, I mean, literally the performance left off it. I mean, he kept telling me because he couldn't get me to complete the campaign. Cause I have two favorite characters. Um, like it's like, I love Lizzie and I loved Mac. Now, well, once I played Hive Busters, like before that, I liked Mac, but I didn't know a story. Cause like you said, all I heard Mac do is pop a one liner and go, Ooh, ow, ouch, ow, I'm on fire. <laughs> get me up. I'm bleeding, you know, and all yeah. that. But after playing it and getting the cat, he even said, You're going to love Mac. And I played Mac and I said, You are right. And I said, <laughs> This, I would have paid full price just for the high, but I'd, in fact, I'd pay full, I'd pay full price for them to leave out the campaign and just have <laughs> high busters on it. The only good thing about the campaign is I got to meet Lizzie, but I only got to meet her for a short while. So I was actually. That's so happy. interesting because it was the very first, it was, they sent me a copy of Gears 5 for uh -huh. Xbox which I didn't have, so I had to run out and buy an Xbox so I could play this game. And uh, so I played, I was like, oh, this is, cool. again, I knew nothing about the previous franchise whatsoever. So I was playing it, you know, I have a hard time with the controllers. I'm a, I'm an old school, like, keyboard and mouse guy. So these X, these newfangled controllers, hey! I can't wrap my brain around them. But uh, I enjoyed it. But again, I, I'm not a, I'm not a true fan because I didn't know what came before, you know? Uh, the first three were very similar to Hive Busters. Like for me and Blood Axe, it was like going back to the exciting gameplay, and we were rolling, man. And I mean, uh, we were clowning, and I'm with them with Mac, and I'm just like, I'm gonna make every one of these bastards pay, you know? I was just like, I've listened to his story, and I was like, oh, my, my boy, my boy. Like I was like, I was like <laughs> red faced. He heard I was ranting about my boy when I found out. Oh wait, spoilers. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think. That snippet of Mac's backstory about his son mm. put a lot of your dialogue in context, at least for me as a fan, through playing regular escape. Because you did seem like you were kind of reckless. Uh, at least the character was reckless and ready to go. Uh, while Keegan mm -hmm. was a little bit more um, reserved and, and um, t tactical. But when we played the played high busters, well, yeah, you were a civilian. You weren't a, an inscripted, or you didn't you didn't sign up. So it does make a lot more sense. But seeing the development of the squad come together, we're hoping there's more Scorpio squad in Gear Six. I want Gear Six to just be Scorpio Scorpio squad again, man. Uh, <laughs> and I play Mac. I get Mac. Uh, Ms. Blood Axe is gonna have to play Lonnie. I want, well, Blood Axe can play Keegan. Uh, I'm you know, Keegan. you like Keegan, so that works. I like Keegan too, but I, but ever since then, I play Mac. Like, I've been I playing. I, I'm like, oh, look, we're in escape. Let me grab my boy. I'm going to go in here, <laughs> get this big. I also love pistols too. And I don't know how much you played of it, but his, like his escape build, did you get the big Magnum pistol? And I'm all about that. I'm just like, yeah, that fits it. A, a good old Scottish boy with a big, big pistol sounds just right. That sounds like what it should be. <laughs> But, um, Black, you got any more for Gears before we go into territory where you're not going to know what I'm talking about at all? <laughs> well, I was going to ask, Trevor, was there a favorite line that uh, you came up with or that, uh, uh, for Mac, whether it be for uh, the, the DLC or for uh, Escape in general? That I came up with? Oh, boy, I don't remember. It, uh, we, we did so many lines and so many versions and so many... There were so many rewrites, and and like I said, this was over the course of several years. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, it's hard to remember any one thing. I just the thing I remember the most about the experience was um, was doing that performance capture work with with scenes. We were actually playing scenes, and you're physicalizing the scenes like an actor <laughs> on a on a stage uh, with other actors, which is a rare rare thing when you're doing voice work. Uh, yeah. But it was um, it was great. It was it was. Uh, you know, especially those scenes where he's talking about where you discover, you know, he had this son that got taken and killed and he's basically got a death wish. And he's like, you know, come what may, I'm going to I'm just going to go in and just get myself killed because what the hell does it matter anymore? Right. So he's, he's sort of a tragic figure. And I think that I think that um, juxtaposes well with his sort of sense of humor, you know, like he's this guy mm -hmm. cracking jokes, but he's got a death wish. He's yeah. he's a serious dude. You know, so I think it's mm -hmm. it was great. You know, I gotta I gotta I gotta hand it to the writers and the creators. They they know what they're doing. I just I just say the words, right? I just say the lines. So I can't really take credit for that, you know. <laughs> yeah, I, I almost felt like oh go and, ahead, man. Uh, I, 
Uh, my favorite one, I can't remember all of it, you might be able to, was about the the no-quit attitude. Hmm. Yeah. I don't know. That's a while ago, dude. <laughs> I love I love his story about got to surprise the boy somehow. No, got to surprise the boy on his birthday. The story of his oh, uncle kicking yeah, a toy right. out the door. Oh, I was right. got to surprise right, the boy on his right. birthday. Big... And I was just like, all right. Yeah, in the plane. Right, I so hate surprises. I'm a wee lad, and it's my birthday. And my crazy uncle, or whatever it is, comes over, and he says, here you go. And, and I open, and I, yeah, I remember that bit. Yeah, right? that's, already, where, that's where he gets kicked out of the plane by Keegan right at the very end and gives him the old <laughs> double birds. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes, I mean, and from the beginning, you y'all brought those characters to life in a way that no other character, like, uh, really got brought to life. Like on our list of characters in Gears Five, like Team Scorpio as a unit with Mac as our favorite, but all three being very well done. Uh, and then the Carmines, Lizzie and uh, Clayton, who hasn't really had as I haven't gone through the campaign, but also. He manages just through his dialogue, even in matches, to just really bring out his personality. And that, to me, is that real difference, is when a voice actor working on what you've been given, which usually, like you said, we've talked to enough voice actors, even from Gears, to know that apparently they don't tell y'all crap. Like y'all, like you said, they're just going like, here's a rough idea what this character may be like. Go with it. Somehow y'all <laughs> yeah. bring it off, man. You, you really inject a lot of personality. Getting it out in the fewest amount of lines, uh, you know, establishing a personality is really good. Just like with, like I said, Rock Raccoon. You got a character like, I'm a raccoon with a gun. I got to find a way to make people care. Because, <laughs> like, there's, yeah. like there's, a, there's a giant tree man and all this going on over here. How do I make people care what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'm going to turn Q loose now and then uh, let, let him go like, off like, like the Energizer Bunny. I'm not going to go too crazy, but no, like I said, I've actually seen a, a lot of your filmography. Like you've done an amazing amount of animated work. And what got me is how it's just all across the board, all the way down to like little children's stuff, like Captain's Underpants is like, you know, my, my son was reading that when he's like eight, you know, and then, but then I saw like X-Men, Inuyasha, and I was like, okay, he is just like, you, you apparently have broad appeal. <laughs> but really got me is that Mac sounds nothing like Rocket Raccoon and none of these other. I'm looking at the characters going like, I would not have picked your voice out. Like, uh, as a compliment to you, I don't recognize you from any of your work. But it's because you change your voice that much. That talking to you now, when you first came on, I said, he didn't sound like any of those people. Was my <laughs> first thought. <laughs> I was like, he didn't sound like any. So you don't do any of them in your own voice, it seems. But that's actually an accomplishment. Because it means you have that range. Which one of those stick out to you? Because there's too many. Like, if I tried to pick a favorite, we'd be here all night. Well, yeah, me too. It's, um, you know, when you, when you ask what they call a utility actor, which is what I am, <clears throat> someone who plays a bunch of characters, um, when you ask them what their favorite is, that's sort of like trying to ask someone what their favorite child is. Very strange I can question say that, to answer. I can say that easy. Uh, I can tell you what my favorite <laughs> one of his kids are. I can tell you my favorite of Blood Axe's kids. <laughs> I have favorites amongst other people's children. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's weird. I mean, it's Thunder Max. There's been there's been so many, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of characters. I forget most of them. You know, uh, a lot of the times when I doing when I'm doing interviews like this, people will say, "Oh yeah," and then you played such and such in this show, and I will just have no idea what they're talking about because <laughs> that was three years ago, and it's just I. I, I exist in a fire and forget kind of thing. I go in, I do the job, and then I'm on to the next job. So unless unless it's a big one like a rocket or a Mac or something like that, uh, a lot of the time it's fire and forget. I throw my my whole self into it when I'm doing the job, and then that's it. You move it on to the next one. Uh, so it's weird. I mean, uh, Efforts for Family is a good example uh, because Efforts for Family, I played so many characters on it, but they're all recurring. Mm. So... That was the reason why Michael Price hired me, because he said, I need you to play everybody in the town. <laughs> Who is the main characters? Pretty pretty much. Me and a, a handful. That's a good way to save money, I guess. <laughs> Be like, we're going to bring in one guy. He's going to do right. everybody in these four or five people. Right, exactly. So for me, that was that was, that was was like the golden opportunity, because the thing I wanted to achieve when I moved to L.A. was I want to be the utility actor in an adult cartoon. And lo and behold, there it was. F is for family. They it's an adult want cartoon. me to play everybody. In a yeah, in a in a, you know, uh, adult, um, you know, as in not a kids show, uh, and it was great, <clears throat> and that that was another example of how they really let me. Like for example, there's a character I play in that show called Red, and he's a 
he's a baggage. He's one of the baggage guys at the airport. But when I saw the name, I just decided to do him as like a real Texan kind of guy down here like that. And I said, okay, I'm going to play red down here, you know. And uh, next thing I know, they're writing the character like he's been from Texas the whole time. And it's just, it was great. It was like, oh, so like five seasons in, and now there's this whole backstory about Red coming from Texas and everything. And I'm like, that was all me. That was all just me deciding to do an accent. And suddenly this whole, you know, thing emerged that that was super cool. Or like um, <clears throat> one of the other characters I play is Goomer, who's, he's, he's this, <laughs> this neighbor that everyone sort of assumed was a serial killer uh, for a long time. And he still might be. But uh, but Goomer was sort of like uh, Homer Simpson meets uh, Peter Griffin a little bit. So, you know, uh, Goomer was down here, right? One of these guys, you know? And because because Bill Burr is the lead and Bill comes from Boston, he has that accent, it all kind of worked. Yeah, I don't know, uh, uh, Bill, if uh, maybe I was watching it through the window or whatever, right? <clears throat> so it was it was it was nice because they created the writers were able to to create all this stuff based on the choices that the actors made, which is a real, real treat. <laughs> That's a real rare privilege. So, yeah. So okay. see there, people, you get extra value with Trevor Duvall. You can simply <laughs> give him some characters and pretend you wrote them. But in reality, you're just. All right, we're going to go with that. <laughs> Where would, where would you say, how old would you say that character is? How tall? One of these days are going to give you a script. They haven't wrote anything. They're just going to be making the characters as you do voices and not tell you. Just like <laughs> somebody's over there trying to draw them as you're doing them. It's like, just quick, quick, get a sketch, get a sketch. Well, it is it is a testament to the writers that, that when they come in with such strong character frameworks, it just makes it easy for us to just inhabit those, you know? Um, for us, it, it's all instinct, right? I mean, I can't speak for every voice actor, but certainly enough of my colleagues, <clears throat> I think, feel the same way that that we work almost entirely by instinct. So, again, if it's a family, there's a, one of the other characters I play is this old German Jewish survivor of the Holocaust named Mr. Holtenwasser, who all the neighborhood kids think is a Nazi because he has a German accent, <laughs> but he's which not. is, of course, <laughs> a, an, an hilarious irony right there. But uh, so he was. You know, so that was a case where I could suddenly inhabit the character. I was, oh, he was very kind, you know, but he's always very dour as well he, because he's seen all of his friends die horribly. So there's lots of... And that turned out to be like so many of the writer's favorite characters. <laughs> you know? So, it, yeah, it, it, it was just, it was great. It was great. Uh, so, so you have accidentally basically answered the question by saying, obviously, F is for family left quite an impression. <laughs> Well, it did. It, I mean, like I said, obviously, I've, I, I've loved all the characters that I've played uh, to, to, to one extent or another. You know, I, I did all those years with Rocket, which was which was a dream. It was it was, you know, working for Marvel. And and that uh, allowed me to start writing for Marvel as well, which was a huge, huge thing. Um, and, you know, it led into playing a bunch of other characters. I played Ares and I played Claw. Uh, just because one of the producers heard that I could do the Johannesburg accent. And right away he was like, you're the guy. So, okay. You know, it was just, it was a tremendous, tremendous uh, time. Um, but yeah, F is, for, F is for Family was certainly one of my highlights for sure. Well, you said the word play, which makes me go, I gotta, we are not only a comic book and animated shows, but we are also gamers. As you may have noticed, we have the skull. That is a D20 we have in the mouth of the skull there. And that's why the second when we were flipping through there and we saw D20, we were like, oh, wait, is he a gamer? Ooh, and I mean, yes. we mean real gamer. We're not talking about just, like before all this 8-bit stuff, we used to have paper and pencils and basements <laughs> and dice and disapproval and, and disapproval <clears throat> right. from everyone. The church said we were going to hell. <laughs> you, know, like, like, you, you know, you thought you rock stars had it hard. They may have said like they may have said rock and roll is evil, but they have like false documentaries about <laughs> they make That's movies right. and fake documentaries about tabletop gaming back then. That's right. So like I like they they'd much rather have uh, you know Marilyn Manson in their church than like a guy with like a D&D hat on and a <laughs> DM screen. <laughs> that was far scarier. Um I guess because they blended in and they couldn't tell who we are cuz we looked normal <laughs> during the daytime hours. But uh <laughs> You actually accomplished something that I'm still a little shocked by because I thought I'd played it everything, and we were looking at it, and he pulled a character sheet, and I saw, like, I said, what's Iron Sworn? I was like, huh. So, uh, first, the main question is, like, you're a tabletop gamer. Like, uh, that 
but tell us about that because that's awesome that you were also a pen and paper gamer like we are. Yeah, from way back. I, I played my first game in 1979, and it was the village of Hamlet, and it was uh, I was wandering around. I had to, I was like, oh, I don't know, seven years old or something. <clears throat> but this friend down the street had the copy of the DMG, and he had a copy of uh, Village of Hamlet, and so we made up a paladin, and I didn't know what to call him. So we said, how about the name Black Jay? Black Jay sounded super cool. Black Jay was one of the names of the NPCs in the village that the DM just flipped through and went, how about this? And I said, yeah. So my character became like, that was Black Jay. And he, I played him for like 15 years. <laughs> but wow. So I started very, very young. I fell in love very, very young with the game. But growing up in the 80s, you know, uh, you didn't talk about the game. It was not cool. It was not at all like it is today. You, mm. you kind of, you, in fact, we never used it. We never said D and D or role playing. It was always the game. We always talked about the game so that only insiders would understand what we were talking about, <clears throat> but it was a very, very different world back then, but we played, oh my God, I just, I mean, I don't know how many years of my life in, you know, in some total have been dedicated to, to the game. Um, so yeah, I've been I've been doing it my whole life. And then a couple of years ago, I started something called Me, Myself, and Die, which is a YouTube channel where I play by myself. And I play all the characters, and I use something called a GM emulator to basically act as the GM. And uh, yeah, I get seven cameras going, and I shoot it, and I put sound effects and music, and it turns out to be quite an epic little tale. I've done two seasons of it already. Uh, the first season was 22 episodes. The second season was 18 episodes, and it follows the lives of these characters that all get randomly generated by these these random tables and stuff. And uh, yeah, it's it's been going well. There you wow. go. That's cool. So I guess that's why you do Iron Sword. And I noticed when I looked at it but, uh, that it seems to be that it is actually designed for also solo play, which is a unique trait. I have, like I said, I played so many games. I played a few of those, and I had to admit. Like, because I'm going to show my real nerd in chops here. I'm about to really throw it down. Though, actually, Blood Axe will be one of the people that also knows. It kind of reminds me of the Lone Wolf, the, uh, Lone Wolf books. Right. Uh, you know, and I re and it's like a lot of those are like D&D &D crossed with Lone Wolf. And I just love, I actually enjoyed it. I prefer to play with friends, but it is kind of fun to sit down. So, yeah, you have a whole channel. I that You're basically doing that, and, but professionally and much better than I probably ever would have. <laughs> well, uh, I agree. You know, I'm I'm with you on that. Um, for me, the idea of solo role playing was not something I ever did. Uh, the closest I ever got was running myself through a, a a test scenario when I was learning to GM a game. So I would be like, okay, I'm the first thing I do when I buy a new game is I read it and I get to the combat chapter and I okay read that and I make a couple of characters and then I put them in basically what we used to call the featureless gray plane. I put the characters down, use a couple of miniatures or whatever, and I run a test battle just to learn the mechanics of the game and learn the mechanics of combat. And that was the closest I ever came to solo role playing. It was, it was just in service of teaching myself the game to be able to run the game for my friends. Mm -hmm. But as it turns out, there's a lot of people that took it way further than that and actually ran <laughs> an actual game just by themselves. So this Iron Sworn game is uh, something I adopted in the second season. In the first season, I used the Savage Worlds uh, rule set. I like Savage Worlds. Is, the, the, my yeah. friends don't. They think it's too hard. I like it. I think it's Oh, fun. no, no. God, Lots no. no. I, I'd, I'd call Savage Worlds solidly rules medium. There's there's nothing particularly difficult well, about they, Savage Well, they have Worlds. no luck, though. They roll terrible. So, I mean, they well, think that's it's hard thing. just it, because of the exploding it, it, dice so, effect. Right. You know, it's a where... very swingy game with the with the exploding dice and such like that for sure. But um Iron Sworn is specifically designed for solo play. So it 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 uh it puts itself on the on the uh powered by the apocalypse chassis. Oh uh, okay. I've read a couple of those. Yeah. Yeah. So uh it works really well. It took me a long time to wrap my brain around it, but um it works really well, especially for what it does. And uh turns out there's a lot of people that uh dig the game. So a lot of them started to watch the my show and yeah, it's been cool. So uh, when I go into the third season, I'm going to be using a totally different system and uh, and go from there. I would suggest one, but it's it's a currently dead system. But Anima Beyond Fantasy is possibly one of my favorite systems I got my hands on. Now, the bad news is you're going to probably have to go grab the PDF because the physical books now are in the hundreds of dollars as many systems. Uh, right. And, but, I mean, I just throw it out there because – 
it's the it's a hybrid. Well, I love point systems, but mm-hmm. most of my friends think point systems are a little number crunchy. Anima is a hybrid point system. Basically, it's a point system, except you have classes, but those classes inform your point cost. So I'm just going to throw that out there. Maybe we get lucky and you make it popular. Somebody will bring it back <laughs> so I can get more books because it's in Spanish, and I only got a few of the translated books. <clears throat> And I can't speak Spanish well enough to read. I gotta tell you, the Spaniards have put out some unbelievably good games. They did one called Aquarare, which is uh, takes place in I think 14th century um, medieval Spain, and it is awesome. It's sort of a, it's a D100 based system. It's a percentile based system, but it's just awesome. I, I I recently got it, and I'm like, oh, I have to do this at some point. I have to do this. It's so well, good. When you do it, I'll take a look. Because I mean, I've got I've got books that have, people won't even play with me. I've got Seven C. Bought the big golden Seven C book. Nobody wants to learn new rules. I'm just like, oh. The... Yeah. No, I, mean, I know Blood the feeling. I force willing, my but... friends to play with me. That's the thing. When uh, I when I when I have a new game, I'm like, Kate, we're playing this, and they're like, okay, something new. Lock All the right. Door. But, but luckily, I have a bunch of friends that are are very uh, quick when it comes to learning new things. So they're, they're a great test group because we'll play a small little mini campaign and then I'll get bored of it and move on. <laughs> uh, if I have my, I mean, honestly, I know that's the one thing I annoy my fellow because Black Axe is in my group. I know I know my friends with the most is that if I have my way, every campaign, we switch systems. Like I play everything. I'm the same so way. I, it's like, let's do World of Darkness now. Now let's do Best and B20. Now let's do Fifth Ed. Let's do Pathfinder. Let's <clears> jump the same over. Way. Yeah, I mean, I'm like, and I'm like, I'm I'm for that. I'm willing to play a new system every time. Yeah, me too. Then I'm willing to mess with it and be like, now let's make new rules for it. <laughs> of course. We've been doing new ones every time, actually. Like now we're going to Ravenloft from Shadowrun. There's no re- correlation either. There's no pattern to the madness. It's like, oh, we're playing Shadowrun. What's after that? Ravenloft. What's after that? Best in D20, sci-fi, hodgepodge. Blood Axe wants to play Samus Aaron as a Warhammer space marine. Like we're The, the next one after Ravenloft is going to be a madhouse, and I love it. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> then Star Wars is coming. Well, I've covered my 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 rabbit hole. I've jumped all down. Uh, <laughs> we, we went through D and D, back around the cartoons. So I'll let Blood Axe now make us go back to doing official business. He's a professional one. Oh well, I get you fooled if you think that's the case. But um, I am kind of curious. I was looking on your uh, on your Wikipedia, and you do a podcast called Voice Friend. Um, when is the next season coming out? Oh, <laughs> well, I wouldn't hold my breath if I were you. I started that way back in, <clears throat> God, I want to say 2006, I think, that before podcasts were actually a thing. So I was one of the first ones out there. Uh, and it was me interviewing my colleagues uh, mm-hmm. in the voice world uh, up in Vancouver. And it was really great. But I would only do it once every couple months. So over the course of several years, I did a total of 36 episodes. Because uh, I would only do them when I had the chance to do it. And months would go by where <laughs> I wouldn't do a new episode. And the very last episode was in uh, 2013. And my very first guest, who was Sam Vincent, in the very last episode, he interviewed me. So that was kind of cool. But the idea was, uh, it was 2013, and I was, was going to move down to L.A., and I did. <clears throat> but the idea was, okay, well, now we're going to do Voice Print USA, and I'm going to interview all my uh, American uh, voice uh, colleagues down here but then it just didn't happen i got i got so busy with work and i got so i got too busy actually working in cartoons to have any time to actually talk about <laughs> cartoons with my colleagues so you know there's a lot of fans out there that that would still love to see it and you know i never say never but honestly me myself and die is taking up so much of my my time right now when it comes to stuff outside of work uh, outside of the the voiceover world, so uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if there'll be another season. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, it's been eight years, and uh, the last episode had a teaser of, of the next season, which was that's eight years ago. So yeah, I was just curious if we could update our our audience on uh, on something new that was coming up. So you can interview. Well, me. as I said, you want never to say never. But... Me. You can interview me. It's fine. I'll come on. I'll oh, you there you go. Me. There you go. <laughs> I'll talk about something. I'll invent a wonderful story. It's not true, but it'll be entertaining. God, that's like every interview I've ever done. <laughs> Rough with tension and thrills and lies. lies Beautiful lies. Damn lies. 
You are the creative one. That's why we have a reckless speculation segment on our random encounters table. We actually roll a D20 on our weekly show to see what random topic we're going to talk about. So. Uh -huh. <laughs> Yeah, and I love I love that. And he he has some just to mess with me. He'll sometimes just have a weird question, and I have to now come up with something. And then what's disturbing is that when I start coming up with it, I come up with it and I start believing it. So it ends up becoming a crazy tinfoil hat theory because I'm like, no, no, this is good. This is good stuff, man. No, this could work. This could be a thing. <laughs> and I can see him watching it because he's sitting there going like, I'm pretty sure Q wasn't thinking about that till I said that. And now he's got like a new theory about what's going on with disney you know <laughs> i mean uh, yeah especially with star wars i'm a star wars -aholic, so um i'm always uh curious to see what he thinks can happen because i think right now we're in a transition period if we don't know what's going to happen with star wars so my star um, wars script was better the one i came up with even blood x liked it better like i when the first movie came out and i came up with what i think was going on it was vastly superior to what happened. I, I wouldn't normally be that cocky, but I, well, I don't know. It's easy to be hindsight's twenty twenty. So yeah, I'm pretty confident mine was better. You know, they might not well, like mine, but they wouldn't have hated it. Like they hated what came out. <laughs> right. Well, as someone who still works for Lucasfilm, I have, no opinion on the matter whatsoever. Oh, 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 I mean, <laughs> you are oh, correct, no. sir. I wasn't going to try to put you in that position. No. <laughs> but it, it, again, the, the, I am a Star Wars holic. I have Star Wars tattooed on my arm, actually. Oh, wow. Um, actually, it's. He made his wife get a tattoo, man. <laughs> oh, I love my tattoo. No, she's got one, too. She's got the other half of his tattoo. Yeah, so I have the DL 44 Han Solo gun. And she has Princess Leia's gun from A New Hope, and hers says, Clint, I love you. Mine says, Brie, I know. With oh, the there track. you go. So, um, oh, yeah, I mean, I bleed Star Wars, literally. So I'm, I'm, I'm loving The Mandalorian. Absolutely. And I thoroughly enjoy what, what's come, come across with that. And I'm really curious to see what's coming up uh, in the future. I mean, you're talking about some Chief Palpatine coming up in the future. So I can get into that. Can't, can't wait for that. But um, I am kind of curious to see what these other uh, shows, with uh, especially with Kenobi, with Ewan McGregor uh, coming back as uh, as Kenobi, and um, with um, we'll see what happens with the Rangers of New Republic. But I'm even pretty excited about the uh, the uh, Cassie and Andor series. Mm. So, um, but we need to get you in in live action playing a Jedi. I would <laughs> love to see you coming in with your Jedi no, robes on. No, Fear Sith, Sith, Sith. He's got to go, Sith. Well, He's he got to go zappy turn. zappy at least once. Zap. <laughs> <laughs> he can turn, Seth, but uh, other than that, that would, that would be awesome. Mac Especially you already have your foot sit. in the door. So that, that's one step forward. Well, <laughs> that's sort of true. There's there's a big gulf between the voice world and the on-camera world, but but yes, yes, I'm I'm closer no, than a lot might be. I've seen some very – I've no, I've seen some of the acting in some Star Wars stuff. You're fine. <laughs> Bill Burr was on Mandalorian. You worked with that Bill is Burr. true, and he was that much better than I thought. Even though he played Bill Burr, like he's Bill Burr as Bill Burr in a Star Wars show. But I love yeah. Bill Burr, so I was like, "Hey, look, it's Bill Burr," and it was like, and that's all I just saw was Bill Burr. I was like, "It's Bill it Burr." Was, <laughs> it was a weird disconnect because when I saw, I mean, I knew he was doing the show, but when I saw it the first time, I had to text him. I'm like. You had, you, I know you had to write into the contract that you get to swear. Like, I know, you know, even though they, they always cut away before he did, but it was very obvious, you know. I wasn't a fucking stormtrooper, right? The, the first time he did that thing, man, when he's talking to him, when he did the, eh, and I went out here and he was there, he was like, eh, he starts to, and it was usually when he's about to say something, it's probably going to piss someone off. You know, he's yeah. like, it's like, oh, he's about to say something offensive. All right, let's. Yeah. Thank it. I'm unintentionally. I'm not trying to imitate Bill Burr. That just happened. But uh, but yeah, just, he, it's so funny to me because he he knows nothing. He's not a Star Wars mm -hmm. fan at all. You he doesn't tell. have it. What? You want me to go to space or something? What? You know? <laughs> so, so I said you'll be fine because he looked unconvinced the whole time. Now that's the first what I loved about it being Bill Burr is he did not look like he was believing any of this. He was just like, yeah, space aliens, which is, whatever. Which is per perfect for the character he was playing. You know, yep. it, it was it was great. I, I loved him in it. I, I thought it was great. Yeah, so, he may be good. <laughs> come across in the uh, first season the way he came across in the second season. The first season, I was like, oh, okay. He just, he's a little little punk uh, that's working uh, for this, this game. 
But the second season, I thought he did a phenomenal job, especially trying to get under the skin of, uh, of the Mandalorian. And uh, eventually he got to share that uh, that screen moment where he took the helmet off. And yep. he's like, you can see satisfaction coming across Bill Burr's uh, character. And, um, but yeah, I mean, he did a phenomenal job. Uh, yeah. But, but, but our um, main point is, you can do that too. Believe in yourself. Oh, yeah. Believe well, in the, yes. me that believes in you. Yes. Well, I'll, uh, I'll get a hold of my agent and let them know. Yes, tell them <laughs> I sent you. No, don't tell them that. I've talked a lot of crap about Disney. Don't do that. Don't, <laughs> don't mention me at me. all. <laughs> don't drop me your blood axe. We, we, we are not popular people. If they don't know us, they don't need to find out about us. <laughs> tell them somebody <laughs> likable sent you. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm very passionate about Star Wars. So um, uh, I'm, I'm, every time I have a guest on that's done Star Wars, I have to talk Star Wars with them. Of course. And even those that haven't done Star Wars, I have to talk Star Wars with them anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you were on Star Wars. like, <laughs> All right, well. Uh, yeah. We got I, in that discussion with uh, Angel Desai. She, she wants to do Star Wars. She just can't get her, her foot in the door. <laughs> So maybe she needs to team right, so up I with a certain voice actor and we can get them both in there. Uh, All right, there we go. We're going to just, you know, we're just going to go down our list of interviewers and just start pushing them into Star Wars because Blood Axe wants all y'all in Star Wars. <laughs> just be like, get in there, get live action. Well, good, talented people in Star Wars, absolutely. That's I mean, true. the more the merrier. They have all these new franchises and these new series coming. They need people to be able to play those roles. Whether sure. Whether you're voicing an alien or whether you're playing a Sith, either, either way, we'd love to have you in Star Wars, man. Well, mm -hmm. in live action too. We already got you as she, which is hilarious, by the way. I love your um, your rendition of uh, of Palpatine because you do Thank have you. a little crazy tweak to it. That's uh, because in in the film he was always you know um, aristocratic and proper and. You know, you always moving the chessboard, and you're like Chief uh, when he first wakes up and has like five cups of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I do have a listing of ways for uh, our fans to be able to uh, to follow you. We have your website, TrevorDuval.com. Uh, also, your Instagram, uh, which is TDuval.com. Twitter's TrevorDuval.com. I'm also going to post a link to your YouTube channel, uh, Me, mm -hmm. Myself, and Die. So all four of those um, sites will be available in our feed. Are there any other ways uh, that our fans could uh, follow you uh, in, in the uh, public space? Uh, well, I have the Patreon as well, which is for me, myself, and I. That's just, uh, you know, Patreon slash me, myself, and I, if they're interested in that. But, yeah, I think you covered it. I don't really, uh, I don't really engage with social media on the whole a lot, um, other than the, the YouTube thing. <laughs> Good uh, choice. But, uh, <laughs> Well, well we, I do question. want to thank you very much for joining us uh, this evening. Uh, I know we've been planning this for a little bit, but uh, with your move, uh, I know we had to put it out a little bit further. But, you know, I do want to thank you very much, Mr. Duvall, for joining with us. And um, hopefully we'll have you again in the future to talk about more Star Wars. Thank you very much. It was my pleasure.